Yeah, we're good. We're good. All right. Well, this this will be, as promised, a short talk. Um, I think it's actually really, really useful. I've been using it for a while. It's not very hard to set up. It's, you're not going to think I'm a wizard when you go do this yourself. Um, but I think it's still worth it. I do things that really work at cost. Um, so basically, this is about one-time passwords, specifically the, the time-based ones, which are just ubiquitous everywhere, sort of synonymous with two-factor authentication these days. Um, and I'll get into a little bit into it. I'll talk about a couple other sort of one-time password approaches as well. Um, and this is very practical. This is how you can have it tonight if you wanted to, uh, if you don't drink too much. Uh, <laughs> uh, on, on your Ubuntu, Debian, whatever server. <coughs> And this is using Google Authenticator, which is, I, it's probably at this point the best way to do this. Um, it's real easy, um, but there, there's a couple other implementations you can do something similar with. So a uh, quick intro. Uh, my name is Rich Freeman. I've done a few talks here now. Um, I'm a biochemist, uh, by degree at least. Um, I work as a business analyst in the pharmaceutical industry. And here I am, an open source enthusiast, uh, involved with Gen2 Linux as well. Um, kind of my first introduction to Linux was uh, uh, I got a, you know, some Linux books in a bookstore back when we had those, um, and it had a Linux CD in the back, and it was uh, it included a Slackware CD, and I couldn't tell you what version it was, but it was back around '94. Um, it used uh, UMS DOS for the file system, which is basically like you know, POSIX on FAT16, I guess, or whatever. This is like, Jeez. That, it is, there are no long file names in DOS back then. Um, and, uh, you know, since I only had a, uh, you know, probably a, a, a big 120 megabyte hard drive or something at the time, you know, you just mounted, you know, slash user on uh, your CD-ROM, which was really fast, I'll tell you. <laughs> Especially back then. Uh, but I really got into it more seriously in the late 90s and, and you know, since. And as far as, you know, these one-time password generators go, I was checking, and as far as I can tell, I started using the Google Authenticator PAM plugin about three years ago. And actually, I, my first dialing into one-time passwords was around 1996. I was a fresh new grad student at the University of Pennsylvania. This is back in the day. I'm, I'm sure SSH existed, but it wasn't nearly as popular, and Telnet was pretty much the way you, you did everything. <laughs> and I heard all these scary stories about universities and people sniffing networks and stuff, so I figured, you know, I'm going to use SP and set up a whole... I basically carried around in my backpack a page of one-time passwords <laughs> that were pre-generated. <laughs> so, you know, I just cross them off the list as I use them, and so the next time I... Actually, I think it prompts you for which number, you know, they're indexed, and I said, okay, give me password number 127. I look down the page, line 127, okay, and type in this big string of numbers. Good for one login. Now, of course, it didn't help you if somebody then hijacked your SSA, or your SSA, your Telnet connection back then. <laughs> um, or steals your backpack. Although I think you still, I think the way I said it, you still need my password. This was just an addition. Actually, no, no. I think this was in lieu of my password because I didn't want my password going over the network. Right. Um, that was the key. All right. Um, just to warn you, this presentation is it's not one hundred percent stolen. The slides themselves are original. Everything in them is essentially not. Um, so you can find this Gen2 Wiki, Arch Wiki. You name you, you type Google Authenticator Pam and name of your distro or Google Authenticator in your distro, you'll find a page on exactly how to do this. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about how it works, just a little bit. Alright, so Google Authenticator itself, I mean this is just one implementation of this. Um, has, has everybody here used Google Authenticator probably? I think so, yeah. A lot of them. Yeah. It's just a little app. There's a screenshot I grabbed out of the Play Store. You know, it generates, you set it up, an account on it, and it basically gives you a six-digit number that changes once a minute. And that's what a time-based, one-time password generator is. These passwords are good one time only, and they change every minute. Um, so it kind of, you know, your, your ability to, to use it if you get your hands on one of these is pretty limited. Um, there's actually, a, you know, so Google, it's kind of branded, but this is actually, their, their implementation is based right out of this RFC, um, so it's a completely open, I think the, the 
program itself, I think it's all open source. So, you know, don't let the Google scare you. This is all, you know, all open, free open source software. Um, I think it's on GitHub. So let me kind of talk how this works. There are a bunch of components. It's, it's not that complicated, but there are a couple layers to this thing. So one, you need the, the client, like what runs on your phone or your watch or whatever else. Um, you know, such as Google Authenticator, you know, you know, being the, the one that's named after, but but you can find, you know, a bunch of competitors, I'm sure. Uh, install that from your phone package manager or app store or whatever they call it. Um, then you need the PAM library, which is what goes on your server. And that's almost certainly in your distro package manager. It's usually called, like, Google Authenticator or Google Auth PAM or, you know, something like that. Um, and, and you know, you'll find that easily enough. And then you got to do some configuration. So you got to configure PAM, assuming your distro doesn't do it for you, most don't seem to, um, to actually use the, the PAM library to, to do the authentication. You got to configure any services that are going to use it, like SSH or whatever, to allow the interactive login to take place. And then there's a little bit of user level configuration. You actually got to set up your keys and pair your user account with your phone so that you actually get the keys. Uh, and I'll kind of walk you along. Really easy. All right, so this is a one-liner. For any PAM services desired, and usually end up sticking it directly in your SSH service and PAM, you, you add this line I have here, off required PAM Google Authenticator um, Now, if you use sufficient instead of required, um, then it allows you to substitute your one-time password for your regular password. So you can log in even if your regular password, whatever you punch in the password prompt doesn't match, it's no problem. The authenticator code is good enough to get you in. Um, you know, actually, I'm do the demo. I'll do the demo real quick. So this is just an SSH client, and I don't have a key or anything set up. So first, I need my regular password, and now I need my code, which Right. It's 015 Enter. Oh, and it's good. So if somebody had sniffed my keyboard or this, that, whatever, I they would have gotten my password, but my one time password, no good. Um, so yeah, this, this is basically what it does. And, if, and the way I have, if you set up this you know, off required, that essentially means that any user account you have, if you have not configured it for Google Authenticator, it will always fail. Um, and so, and that's something you can, there, there's a way you can pass an option to that instead which will allow, if it's not set up, it'll just kind of, it'll, it'll pass through. Um, but that essentially protects, because I don't have this set up on my root account, so when I see the 50,000 brute force attempts on my SSH server all day, I don't really lose any sleep because, you know, there's no way they can succeed. And even if they tried against my real account, they would have to both hit on my password and hit on the one-time password both at the same time, which is, you know, extremely important. Um, so you set this up in PAM. Now you gotta configure your service. Um, you know, everybody's got instructions for SSHD. You could probably get this to work for, I mean, you probably get it to work for Telnet. It's got to, in order for this to work, you essentially need a console-based login of some kind. Because it's interactive, right? So it's going to give you a prompt, then it's going to give you another prompt. So, you know, like SSH just passing the password through, that'll work. And then you just get, it'll log, it'll look like you kind of logged in, but then it gives you the prompt to enter your, your one-time password. But if you're trying to use this for something like POP3 or... Uh, uh, actually, like SCP clients and that sort of thing, it, it, it's, it's a nightmare you'll never get to work um, because those sorts of clients aren't designed to allow any kind of interactive login process. Um, but for SSHD, um, you just set password authentication to no, and you tr there's an option in SSHD, challenge response authentication, yes, which basically turns SSH like into a pass-through to whatever PAM is trying to do, and that's what generates that prompt. Um, and I found the docs, I, it probably varies by distro or defaults, but um, a lot of them say use PAM, yes. Um, 
that probably prevents SSH from trying to like directly, you know, read your shadow file or something and you know bypass and the pain configuration. And then you know that's what the administrator has to do. And then each user account that you want to set this up with, there's just a shell program called Google Authenticator, and you follow the prompt. So I'll uh, show you what that looks like. If I run this, I want sure I want time-based tokens. Uh, the console is too big, but this thing actually it's a text QR code. <laughs> <laughs> you can also it also gives you a, a link um, that you can use and pull up a GIF in a browser or whatever. But you take a picture of that with the client, and it'll set it up. Or you can sit there. You know, it tells you what the secret key is. So you can also key that thing into your phone. And by the way, it's not. I mean, depending on what your goal is, if you write that down somewhere, it does mean that you can set up another phone in the future without having to, you know, go through this. Uh, it also gives you some emergency scratch codes. So these are one-time use passwords. They will work any time, once each. Um, so if for some reason you lose your phone or something and you need to get in, one of these codes will work, uh, once only. And I'm going to say, no, I'm not actually going to write this because I don't want to repair my phone and that makes that secret key on the video absolutely worthless. Um, but, you know, if I had said yes, I would have rekeyed my, uh, I, actually, I think that it does the normal interactive thing that it'll say, okay, enter, enter the current code, you know, on your phone. Just It just ensures that the timers are in sync and everything's working before it changes your credential. Oh, yes. That is, you go ahead, Keith, because that's basically the gist of it. Uh, oh, no, I was just saying, so what's the purpose of the QR code again? It's just, uh, that's it's just, just the code? So you need to get this secret key into your phone. Oh, so you can scan, okay. okay. And um, and so you take a picture, because normally you run the app, whenever you hit the plus button in the app to add a new mm -hmm. code, I mean, this is how, like, if you set up Google Authenticator with Gmail or with, you know, almost any service, they'll give you a QR code, you take a picture yeah. of your phone, and it's set, and that's literally all it's doing is passing the secret to the device. Probably also the name of the account as well, um, which I think it just uses it, like your email address or whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking. I'm just looking on, at the Pearl module for it. It looks like it's a secret key and the key ID, which is the user. Yeah, the user, the user mm -hmm. And the key ID doesn't. It's not part of the algorithm. It's just so it displays. So that way, you have ten of these set up Google Authenticator. You know which yeah. one's which. Um, you know, so that way you don't use your Gmail code to log into your home computer. Um, And then again, if you look into the documents, there are some options. So you can you can make it so that if you don't set this up on a user, it just passes through and will just take their password alone. But by default, if they don't run this Google Authenticator program, that user account cannot log in. And it just creates a file in your own directory that's got the secret key in it, essentially. You can read it and you know, it's got, you know, there's nothing special about it, uh, except that you probably want to make sure it's you know change mod. You know, 400 or whatever. <laughs> Everybody else isn't reading your secret keys. Right. Of course, they still need your password to get it. Unless you set up a suspicion. Um, a couple extra credit things. Um, so I mentioned ST at the beginning. This is sort of one of the original one time passwords for Unix. Um, it's very similar. Typically, the way this, there's a lot of ways. There's, there's a PAM module, I'm pretty sure, these days. I mean, this predates PAM. <laughs> but these days, there's a, a, a PAM module which will work very, very similarly to, to what you just saw. Um, but the way you used to do it back before there was uh, um, PAM, you'd have an ST account, essentially, set up with an empty password, or you could put a password on it, I suppose. I think it, it, I think it ran it as UID0 or whatever, and then its default shell was the ST application. So basically, you log in from Unix into S-Key, and then S-Key would run, you know, it would ask you for your user ID and to punch in your one-time password, it would authenticate you, and then it would, you know, you know, change user or whatever to, uh, you know, your account and basically act like a, you know, a Getty or whatever. Um, uh, these other two ones um, I, was, I was looking at, you know, these also appear to be you know, viable options out there. Um, you know, there's two other options. I think both of those are one-time passwords. So, you know, the, the Google Authenticator approach is time-based one-time passwords. Just strict one-time passwords are usually, I mean, there's a couple different 
ways they can work, but typically they're sequential. So every time you, you click on it, it gives you a new password. And then the, the issue with it is that, so it's not churning one out every minute, um, but the, uh, the one downside is you have a synchronization issue, right? So it does work if you don't have times in sync, but, um, but otherwise if you have like five different clients and you log in from one client and not from another, you know, this client might be three passwords in the past and you gotta keep, you know, figuring out which one's the current one. S key would get around that. The way S key actually worked originally is you would run a, it was really designed to be run for client side, side tool. So basically, you would type into the client your secret passphrase, which is basically it would get hashed into part of the credential, um, and then and then the uh, and then you would type in an index number, which was just sort of you know it would just increment. So every time you generate a new key, it actually decremented. So you know, the first one might be two hundred, then one ninety nine, one ninety eight, or whatever. You punch those two in the client, and then it would spit out a password, which then copy and paste into your Telnet session or whatever. Um, the, but the other way you can do it is you can just tell it's just, the, you know, the clients just pre-generate 200 passwords and dump them out and print them and carry them in your wallet or whatever, and that, that would also work. And that is the talk. Any questions? I, mean, I can show you, I, I've got the, I can show you my config files or whatever. How, how do the two parts stay in sync? So it's time-based. And there's a couple of things. So first of all, your clock, at, you know, you're running NTP on both ends. So they're going to be in sync. It only needs to be sync within a minute. It only changes once a minute. And then typically, and it's configurable if, if you dive into the options, but I think it will go like three minutes into the past or the future. So basically, when it authenticates, mm -hmm. if that code was valid, you know, up to three minutes earlier or later, it'll accept it. Okay, so it's using it's using an algorithm on both ends that gets initialized once. Yeah, so basically you've got that secret key, secret and I don't know exactly what the math is, but right, so I'm pretty, pretty sure you're, you're taking this and you're taking the time, you know, as a salt, you know, and you're you're combining. Okay, but it's not. But it's not talking to Google every time. No, no, no. This is completely. This will work without any. Well, I mean, I guess you need a network connection to connect to your server. Right, but you need your network connection to set it up and to. Yeah, but like my phone, if my phone was offline, the Google Authenticator, authenticator client would work perfectly fine. It just as long as the clock. But if you're if you're home and I'm on my laptop, I want to SSH into my server, and Comcast is down, I could still use this to get in as long as oh, the or time time as, long as long as your SSH connection works, right. you're fine. Your phone does not have to have service. Okay. There's not. It's not like now the other two-factor approach, and there and people are messing with this is where. Yeah, you click on the website and then it causes, you know, an app does a it does a push to an app on your phone which pops up a box and you hit the yeah, okay button. Way, this way seems that good. that requires a network. Um, okay, my second question was why would you want to use this instead of just sending your like using a Sage key server to Well so this is so one of the options is so I actually use and the way I have my SSH set up, if I have a key based login, it'll bypass. This is only required if I'm using a password log. So this gives me the ability, like, suppose if you want a, pl a talk at Plug Central, um, you know, and you know how the network is <laughs> Central. So if I want to use that PC they have sitting down there that I'm sure has got who knows what running on it, and I want to SSH into a uh, dummy account, not only could it be a dummy account on my home computer um, with a dummy password, but I can stick an OTP on it, see if they they hack it, they're not getting in there without, you know, because it's, it's one time use only. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the configuration is all on the, it's all on this, the SSHD part of it, right? So it's on the yeah. machine. So you could, can you use like any, you could, you could take PuTTY, right? You could put PuTTY on there. Yeah, it's just as long as it allows interactive login. So right. it's, just, it's, um, it's in the terminal. Yeah, it works fine with okay. PuTTY. It's nothing special on the client. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, it's almost very similar to the uh, RSA secure IDs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that yeah. was like one of the early, you know, well, still, they still exist. I, I, I actually looked around briefly, but somewhere I must still have that like, credit mm -hmm. card side. Yeah, I've seen oh, yeah, they're they're small. Small. Yeah, oh, yeah, there are a lot nicer than this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here's my like PAN configuration. Mm -hmm. you know, <coughs> off required PAN Google Authenticator. No, what the hell? 
But to what extent does Google able to log into your system? No. Nothing. Uh, the software is theirs, but there's no. This thing does not talk to Google at all. It's just an algorithm, and it's and it's and it's an open algorithm. Oh, I see. So the phone is using the key to generate, and this is using the key to generate. And they Google come really is not involved. No, it's just they, they, so they're they the ones so who have it. So they say, right? Yeah. Well, it's open source, so you can read it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is all, it's under, it's developed by the uh, OAuth uh, um, people, I, I so if it's, if it's uh, Well, that's another implementation, but, but again, this whole thing is, it's based on RFC. Like, these, these keys are based on, um, you know, this RFC, so any... Any client and any PAM plugin that both use this RFC, they're going to generate the same. Sure, but the nice thing is that you've got it on your, like you've got it on your phone, you've got it on your watch, and you just yeah, exactly. Right. You know, it just which I never get why uh, you know my workplace they've got this Symantec one-time password mm -hmm. generator. I don't know why they're using the Symantec one, but because it's Symantec, because it's <laughs> it still doesn't talk to it's somebody. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's got it's got a, it, it's the same thing. It's just it's a proprietary algorithm, so oh. you know its keys are not compatible with anything. Of course not. So you know if if there's a Symantec app for your phone, you're good. If not, you know you got a Windows phone or something. And it was, I will tell you, this took me like 15 minutes to set up and work right out of the box on Gen 2. <laughs> so <laughs> you know it, this is really easy, and if it's if being able to log in with passwords and not having keys preset or whatever is useful. You should consider it. It even works with things like, I think SSH copy ID works fine, you know, even with the extra key and everything. Did, did you, when you were setting it up, did you do it on a dummy account or on your own account? I don't know, my account, but I'll set the console and, a bit. Well, the danger is that you can lock yourself out and then you can't plug in at all. Well, yeah, so if you know, if you stick in, like, you know, the off user PAM account, you know, PAM, uh, you gotta, if you stick it directly in the SSHD PAM config, you can't get, at most, you can lock yourself out of SSH. Now, if you stick it in, like, the generic off user or whatever, then, yeah, every single service, get E, and everything on your PC now requires this to work. And you can do that. I mean, you could, you could secure your virtual. Terminals with this or whatever. Hmm. I mean, any, anything that has a terminal attached to it for authentication will work. So, uh, oh, I see. So you could say, if you had twenty users, everyone would have a different uh, yeah, it, it's secret key. Own, so, it's yeah, okay. Secret. I mean, Root can sit there and read their files and get that. Key out, so but you said it changes yeah, what, once it, a minute, so can't someone, if someone's sniffing it, they can for a minute, they can log in with that. So one it's all configured with typically set up so that the code is only usable for one attempt. So once it succeeds, um, the, uh, it won't accept that code again. It remembers that it solved that one. So, so then you have to wait. You well, then you got to sit and wait a minute for the next code. So if you, if you pass on your authenticator code but mistyped your actual password, so you fail, uh -huh. now you got to sit there for 30 seconds to try again. Or you can turn that off. You know, you're still, I mean, SSH is going to still throttle brute force, and it's still only good for that one minute period. But yeah, if you, if you allow reuse and somebody can replay your username and password within a minute, yeah, that would be um, so, what would happen? Um, I guess the case. Um, oh, if you're so, I with SSH, I almost always log in with keys. So, not not passing a password. Can yes. you use this in addition to the key, or possibly? I don't know about that. I think I think SSHD. I have to dig through how the SSH, you have to look at the SSH okay. key, uh, configuration. So I think if SSHD gets a hit on your key, you know, your key, I don't think it even touches PAM. It just, you know, reads your, okay. you know, just change user ID and all that, you know. Oh, so, because this is all set up in PAM. Yeah, so it's got to get So it's got to get PAM first. Yeah. I think, I think so, but, uh, you know, I, it might, you know, there might be an option in there. Google. Yeah, I, I see that as a less useful option, but I was just curious about it because um, 
I manage a bunch of servers. And yeah, I mean, clearly SSH keys are, yeah. are if, if anything, probably a lot more secure. Um, but this is an option, like, you know, when you need to get in there and you need to be able to use a password and not have, you know, you can't trust your client or, or set up a thing. You know, plus if you don't trust your client, the last thing we do is stick a key on it, right? That right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know unless you're going to authorize it and deauthorize it five minutes later. Um, you know, and even then, you know, initially setting up the key on a server is kind of a pain in the rear end, because unless you use a password to log in or something, you got to have some way to get that key. You know, I mean, you can generate it and then copy and paste across two computers, you know, but it's a, that's a pain. Where, so this, you know, it's a lot, you know, you can just SSH in, and the first time you use the password, you know, just set it up. When, when you were um, doing a research, I'm just kind of curious, like, what, the, I guess, the, the motivation to use this, because, I mean, there's obviously yeah, lots yeah, of different Yeah, so ways. just so I could on computers, like, for example, well, now it's not so bad, but I remember, like, the, uh, the, the, whatever that shell was called, Crosh or whatever in, in Chromebooks mm -hmm. or whatever, it's got, like, a GIMP SSH client mm -hmm. that support key logins. Right. You know, so if you, you know, th there's situations where you may have to use SSH and you can't have the key set up or you don't trust the client, mm -hmm. you know, that the key would end up being mm -hmm. on or whatever. And this is a way to get yourself in. Now, again, things like SCP and that kind of, which are designed for interactive keyboard use, mm -hmm. you're still going to have issues because SCP is not going to be able to get in. So the so one idea would be if you can't do something with a key um, or or cert, let's say, this is another way. This to is a keep, fallback because yeah. it's a lot more secure than just a password. Right. You know, and somewhere. Cool. I mean, this this you're not. I mean, you're getting the password. You know, if you're sniffing the keyboard or whatever, you know, they're getting your password. So now, from the network, they're not getting your password. Um, but you know, if they can sniff your keyboard, they're getting your password. So. That's not ideal. There's probably a lot of things. Then you get an IMAP or who knows whatever. You know, they have your password. There's probably other doors into your system. Um, but it definitely, at least, it keeps them away from shell. You know, most right. Of them. Any other questions? Wow, this is like a long fast talk. <laughs> <laughs> All great questions, uh, you guys. So. How many of you guys are going to set this up at your home? Excellent. I probably will, yeah. I mean, you, you should think of, you you said, if, you're, if you're 100% keys, you know, you probably don't need to. I'm, so. I'm in live stream mode right now. <laughs> What's this? Yeah. It's playing videographer. <laughs> Once. Okay. I think I put it in the Oh, no, I have to, I have to update the uh, fast time. Uh, it should work over Telnet, it should work over RSH, I would think, you know, so got all the protocols covered. Right. Over? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Does the Gopher even, yeah, Gopher support, I think it's got that. I think you should. I would use Pam, I think Gopher predates Pam by quite a while. Yeah. Pam come around. Modern really Gophers like may support Pam, though, who knows? What's that? Maybe modern gophers, gopher clients. Maybe is there such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> Over, <laughs> overbite. It'd be more like, it'd be more like modern gopher servers. Servers, but, uh, gopher servers. Well, you, you you could you know cobble this something together if you really wanted to gopher have a secure. It's actually that's actually going to be my pet project in there REST. There we go. So on Gen two, we've got K so there's a KIO sleeve for for Conqueror for Gopher. Ah. Uh, and so you can do the code for URI and Conqueror. Right? Yeah, and Conqueror, and, right? And, 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 you know, it's right there next to oh. fish. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, S. Gopher D, apparently, in Bash, written in Bash. Oh, so you send that to God. Oh, <laughs> oh, God. I mean, Firefox has that, uh, has that Overbyte FF extension based off of the abandoned, uh, well, removed Gopher code from... Firefox three points or yeah, Firefox three point six and earlier. So three point six was the last Firefox to support Gopher officially, and then four point oh they got rid of all the Gopher code and there's like, well, if, if anyone else wants to implement Gopher in a memory safe programming language, aka probably JavaScript, <laughs> um, like someone someone can take that up and then like the overbite people um, who run, I believe I believe they run Floodgap. 
or at least one of the people who uh, have something to do with Flood Gap. Um, they they came up with Overbite FF, and I guess I guess they did something with it. It, it still works. It's just not multi-process compatible. <laughs> Whack, Whack a gopher. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, no gopher. Sorry. Aww. Yeah, it's fine. Gonna have to use Firefox if you want. I will. I will send out my slides because you know. Yeah. The people on the Arch Wiki are just clearly not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you for putting up with my talk. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. yeah. Definitely a market if uh, somebody wants to do a talk just on Pam itself. I think that would be a fascinating talk.